Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. Today we're going to talk about the future of warfare. And we're going to have this discussion with Rupmati Khandakar, uh, who is a global strategist or a geopolitical analyst um, about what is going on in modern warfare. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Ajay, and thank you for having me on your show. It's always my pleasure. You sent me an interesting chart um, from the intelligence community about exactly how things are changing. And indeed, you know, if you read the paper, every day there's something that's happening that is a change, uh, a remarkable change, a creative change, uh, a change that you know will cast a shadow going forward. Can you talk about some of those changes? Jay, uh, today we are uh, talking of the changes in uh, military thinking, the future of warfare, like it would be. And so uh, we are confining it to military, uh, the future of military warfare, just for a reason that we have such fast technological changes taking place. And so while the drivers of the military conflict may have remained uh, remain the same through, you know, eons, like you have, you know, uh, you have uh, for economic uh, dominance, for territorial, uh, um, you know, supremacy, for resource protection, power, ideological uh, uh, influence, all these factors have prompted war. But what is being used in that war has uh, changed so much, Jay, that the future of uh, warfare is very less likely to depend on firepower and now on the power of information, Jay. So like you spoke about it, it is the C4ISR. Now, what is the C4ISR? That is command, control, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, and R for reconnaissance. So these are the things which will control uh, future warfare. And uh, the way the information concepts uh, will uh, connect to military forces is what will define victory in the future. So, Jay, it's a very interesting topic that we are, you have got uh, uh, into your show today. So uh, it's going to be very, very interesting, Jay. Well, I, I feel that um, we really have to watch this because it, it's not only happening in Ukraine and Israel, it's, it's happening everywhere. And it's happening because everybody sees it. Every, everybody wants to emulate it. I mean, you know that China is watching closely um, to f find the strategies that may work best for it in terms of dominating uh, Taiwan. Um, so we are learning. We're all learning. And I'm not saying these lessons are good. But they're, they're out there and they're happening and they read about them in the paper. No secret. You know, for example, you know, I saw a piece this morning about, um, about liquid natural gas. You know, we're supposed to have sanctions. Um, Western Europe is supposed to have sanctions against uh, the importation of liquid natural gas, or you thought they did. But in fact, those sanctions are written down only to include oil and coal, not liquid natural gas. And the result is the Russians have these ships, large LNG ships, uh, all across Britain and in the North Sea, delivering liquid natural gas. And, and the British and the, you know, the EU um, are paying millions and millions of dollars for that gas. So what kind of a sanction is that? You know, this is a, this is a moving target, literally. And of course, the, the, the ships are insured by British insurance companies. Um, they're organized by British capitalists. Uh, it's quite remarkable um, that this, this is happening. But, you know, so you thought that one effort to stop Trump, uh, rather, you thought that one effort to stop Putin was uh, sanctions? Sanctions are really questionable these days. And on the other hand, there are, you know, weapons being developed, including weapons that, that are being developed and manufactured uh, do-it-yourself manufacture in Ukraine that are very effective. And uh, the latest story is they're developing drones that lock onto a target and then go in for the kill. This is a robotic killing machine. Um, and so, and they're making them and they're designing better and better ones. And the Russians are trying to do the same thing. They're making glide bombs. The glide bombs are cheap um, and very mm -hmm. efficient at destroying civilian targets. Um, and of course, the Ukrainians have these uh, boats with explosives and they need GPS. Uh, Elon Musk was of no help to them, um, but other GPS um, 
you know, facilities are, and they're able to blow up Russian ships uh, in the Black Sea and around Crimea using these uh, remote controlled uh, boats. So, I mean, and these are cheap compared to the value of a big Russian warship. And so that also is something that the U.S. should be looking at. I mean, we have these trillion dollar carriers, um, but if the same kinds of weapons are used against these trillion dollar carriers, um, gee whiz, um, uh, we may have lost a trillion dollars and thousands of people involved. And that's only the weapons. Um, and I'm sure that if we look again in six months, we'll find new and creative things, you know, like laser weapons and all that, which people, countries, scientists, even across borders are trying to, you know, like, like in California, they work on software. Well, the software uh, is helping Ukraine. Um, and so cross borders development of software and weapons is very important now. It's a global effort is what I'm telling you. And these changes um, are happening globally. That's just the weapons side of it and it's the sanctions side of it. But you know, you have propaganda and you have gross political, uh, social media moves, even assassinations. So can you talk about the hybrid nature of war as we are seeing it developed, both in you know, Eastern Europe and also in Israel? Jay, you have explained the loopholes of sanctions so well, so uh, really nice about that. And Jay, um, about weapons, if we have to speak, uh, let's take it into three points, like what is the hardware, like the actual weapons which are being upgraded. And uh, before that, uh, Jay, there used to be a saying, you remember that if there's a war anywhere in the world, Russia and America would benefit from the conflict. There was a saying. But right now, when you, you talk about these drones being manufactured indigenously, you know, uh, small, uh, like we have, we have spoken about the uh, about Iran manufacturing the suicide drones, Shaheen. Uh, so these small, small actors have come in and they have changed the game of warfare. There are no regulations on them. Uh, international regulations, uh, they're a big thing in today's world if you want to monitor and everything. So coming back to uh, the hardware, Jay, you have uh, uh, the weapons which uh, now have become more, uh, what do you say? They have become more lethal. The high speed, the high impact, the high productivity that they aim for to make it, you know, and like you spoke about the, the lasers and the high power microwaves that have come in. Now lasers, the only limitations is, is that it has to be in line of sight, very cost effective. Um, we have a clip, I think, graphic which shows what a ballistic missile would have done and what a hypersonic missile does. And um, uh, Jay, space technology supporting uh, military uh, is now the in thing. So the race to space was not just for exploring our unlimited universe, it was to create, uh, to, uh, to, to get um, uh, advantage, advantage in uh, military warfare. So Jay, that covers the hardware part of it. Then the software as to who is using these, how to use these uh, weapons. Uh, and that is where you have um, AI also coming in, how much you can allow uh, unmanned vehicles to come in, how much you can have uh, the least amount of man or your, your, your people in the battlefield to minimize the losses, the human losses. That is the aim, right? So that your intelligence goes into war for you. We saw that in the tunnels of Israel, uh, you know, Gaza, when they have a separate robotic unit, which looks after this, and they have a new robot, which went into the tunnels, which was inaccessible. It would prevent uh, soldiers from dying from the mines, you know, the traps, the that were laid for them. So all these things are very important, Jay, how your software comes. But along with the software, the limitation that software has is the cyber attacks, the control that a person, a rogue uh, element can take onto your software, you know, how they manipulate. You've spoken about this so many times. And um, the third is that, Jay, the user, the end user, who is the user? Um, Earlier, it was the powers, the nations, small or big or great or superpowers or whatever. But today's world, we have insurgents, 
terrorists, non-state actors who can get their hands on these weapons. And that is where the risk of uh, modern future warfare lies. How much can you afford uh, to have uh, these electronic or you know uh, easily accessible or easy, easily movable uh, detectable uh, machines which can fall into the hands of the wrongdoers. Wrongdoers in the sense they will destroy the entire system if it falls into the hands of a wrong person. And uh, Jay, this is the tactical um, setup of warfare and uh, how we function in it is uh, very important because what is going to happen is developments are not going to stop. We are going to have things which are going to keep on coming up, you know, from gunpowder, how it developed to what? We have uh, laser domes, we have uh, robotics, we have AI, we have uh, cyber attacks, we have uh, all these things are new. But, you know, you also have the uh, old-fashioned assassinations going on. You have the old-fashioned nuclear weapons being still developed and arsenal still being stockpiled. So uh, it's a very um, uh, precarious balance between both traditional and modern warfare. And the people who use these weapons are not necessarily the ones who are using them now. In other yes. words, if I read about some you know exotic weapon in the newspaper and, and then I go online, the code is online for for this sort of thing. These these. Uh, killer drones you can get the code online and i can make them in my own basement and depending on my ideology i could attack anyone anywhere and then i can have a false flag kind of um, you know responsibility for it and before you know it you have chaos <clears throat> the weapons that russia is designing can be used against russia i think that's happened or russia can use them against other parties without t t acknowledging responsibility and that's so for anyone everywhere. You know, we've wondered about um, hacking and mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, inappropriate um, activities on the web. And we never know where it's coming from. Well, these weapons can fall in the same place. We may not know where they're coming from. People take responsibility uh, and make statements about how they caused the problem. And that could be true or not true. So <clears throat> all this leads, don't you think, to chaos. Uh, it's hard to find out who's battling who about what. It's hard, it's hard to find out what, where the boundaries are, if there are boundaries. There are no boundaries. I mean, Putin goes all over Europe to try to create chaos and divisiveness, just the way Trump tries to do that here. And, and the bottom line is, if you want to destroy the democracy, the existing institutions, just create chaos. Um, so I think he's not the only player that wants to create chaos. Of course, Iran wants to create chaos. Terrorists want to create chaos. ISIS-K wants to create chaos. And for that matter, you know, Turkey, Recep uh, Erdogan wants to create, create chaos. So <clears throat> uh, because chaos in your hands, at your, at your, at your control, um, leads to uh, make your enemy weaker. You get stronger in creating the chaos, your enemy gets weaker. So, gee whiz, I mean, warfare really has to be defined or redefined based on what we've learned in these two theaters of war. Um, but it's already clear that these advances, I shouldn't use the word advances, that these developments, okay, will affect everyone. Yeah, Jay, uh, these developments will definitely affect uh, each and every person because you see um, the, the risk of having weapons in the wrong hands is so huge. Now, the recent summit that took place when Putin visited uh, uh, Kim Jong, uh, Kim Jong was there at 4 a.m. to receive him at the airport and the bye-bye was through a window plane. So there was a lot of uh, love and everything. But the strategic part was that if anybody attacks Russia, North Korea will attack, and if anybody attacks North Korea, Russia will attack. Now, not, he has Putin created a guard uh, right on the doorstep of America. So that was such a, a planned um, war, war tactic, Jay. I mean, he, has, uh, he can look to this side of Europe and have North Korea, a, a megalomaniac with nuclear weapons at the doorstep of America, 
waiting for Putin's signal. So that is a uh, very, uh, then it doesn't depend, uh, then the type of warfare doesn't matter because we are scared about the nuclear weapon being in his hand. So, you know, this kind of uh, uh, maneuvering that is happening between traditional and modern warfare is so vast, Jay. Uh, you, you remember we had Syria using chemical weapons. So they went right into that. We have biological weapons. Maybe the COVID thing was uh, part of that. But that brought the whole world to a standstill. So different people are using different types of warfare. And the trajectory of modernization and trajectory of development differs, Jay, for each country. So the aims and objectives are different. Like uh, a country like China, who's on the path of trying to become the superpower, right now only Russia and America, but China wants to try to that. They will do some things which will bring the whole world to a standstill again and again and again. So these kind of uh, uh, aims and goals, uh, Russia keeps on developing the intercontinental ballistic missiles, their bombers, their supersonic bombers, you know, the heavy bombers, America comes up with, uh, you know, the uh, hypersonic missiles, then helping, uh, you know, the Iron Dome systems. These are things which are happening individually in each country. But if you look at them, the aims and objectives are very hard to define. What are they aiming for? If it was only for self-defense, like how Israel has never wanted uh, uh, weapons to attack any country. It has always wanted something to defend. That's why the Iron Dome to defend. It is like a karate uh, uh, martial arts that is just for defense. But another country like Iran would keep nuclear weapons just to wipe Israel off the map. So the, see the aims, they are different. So their warfare will also, development will also be different. How, how, how far are we from a, a third world war? And will the Third World War be a kinetic war with nuclear bombs and large, um, you know, groups of infantry on the battlefield? Or will a Third World War be a, a hybrid, an asymmetric war uh, where you, you know, try to undermine the resolve of your adversary, where you try to bring down its power plants uh, using hacking techniques? Uh, where you try to um, undermine its economy and its public opinion and, and screw up its elections in favor of, uh, say, a candidate who favors you as opposed to the maintenance of democratic institutions. I mean, do we need bombs anymore? Do we need carriers anymore? Do we need trench warfare anymore? If we can achieve, um, you know, uh, dominance over our adversaries, without lifting a finger, relatively cheaply, without blowing anybody up, just destroying the society, um, why put our troops at risk? Uh, why um, put the possibility of a nuclear conflagration at risk? Just do it slowly. Make it a war of um, asymmetric attrition. What do you think? <laughs> Utopian World War Three, <laughs> But it, it would be so difficult, Jay. Uh, we had very two good responsible superpowers, Russia and America. So even Russia, uh, America, uh, you know, came close to Russia, but Russia has not retaliated. Mm -hmm. Nor they will want, uh, you know, the head-on confrontation between Russia and America will never happen because there's a lot of responsibility that they have carried on their shoulders. And uh, both know their limitations, both know their strengths, and they act responsibly. The danger of the Third World War will come when a rogue maniac state will try to, you know, uh, prove its dominance uh, in the in, on the international stage, like um, you know, if it was a Middle East conflict uh, ballooning into a world war, that didn't happen because see, Saudi Arabia helped Israel, Jordan helped Israel. So uh, ideologically, the world doesn't uh, come to war on the basis of. Um, you know, just principles. It has, World War Three has got a lot of economic anchoring, Jay. Nobody wants to risk their economy. That's why we are not going to have a World War Three. Mm -hmm. Definitely, because everybody is worried, worried about the aftermath of the war. Uh, uh, people were worried about 
um, you know, what will happen after uh, the war uh, conflict happens? What will be the economy like? Will it rebuilding of social structure? What is my stock market like? Germany is worried about the euro falling. You know, you have those kind of, there are tournaments which are taking place, you know, they will ban them from the Olympics, but uh, the world has gotten into so many other nitty gritties other than war. Earlier, it would be just uh, um, defining of boundaries. So there were world wars. It was annexation of territories or annexation of countries that there were world wars. But right now, everybody is satisfied in their territorial sovereignty. That's why we will never have a world war. We will have conflicts. We'll have side taking in the conflict, but never a head on collision where the world is divided apart. Because territorially, everybody is very secure. Well, you know, you have people who would like to take over their neighbors, who want to mm. do aggression. I mean, I give you Ukraine, which is, you know, is still in, in play, obviously, uh, and Taiwan, which could be in play any day uh, and within the next few years. And so I, I would ask you, what is winning and losing here? Is, <laughs> is winning when you take over and you have troops in the street like Hitler did, marching mm. all over you know, Eastern Europe and Western Europe? Um, or is uh, winning where, where you just change the hearts and minds uh, of people, like uh, what's happening in France right now, moving to the right, and, and they, uh, you know, although they don't necessarily say so, they, they support uh, Putin, um, and uh, they, they change their tune whenever they want in order to um, break down political barriers. But, but they're winning. They're winning against Macron, and that will... Uh, you know, be more and more clear as we go forward. And I suppose you could say that in this country, uh, if Trump supports uh, Putin, and he does, um, then, you know, Putin is winning here. And that will be more obvious if uh, Trump gets back into office. So uh, what is a winner and what is a loser? Um, it's, it's, it's hard to define that. It's hard to define war. It's hard to define asymmetric war and hybrid war, more and more difficult. Uh, and it's hard to define winners and losers. What are your thoughts about that? Absolutely, point on Jay, that uh, uh, it's become relative. Victory has become very relative, you know. Uh, last we know that Russia had 18% of Ukrainian territory. 18% is a big uh, number. And Taiwan, anytime waiting to be gulped down by China. So, uh, you know, uh, the, turning the blind eye towards annexation of these small territories, which are relatively not big players on the world stage, that is going to cost each and every, uh, you know, there's a morality that comes in. We have seen two years on, the war is raging on in Ukraine. Nothing has been done. There is no collective. Uh, I told you, if the, you, Europe wanted to stop, they could have all lined up on the border and said stop. But they don't want to do that. They want to sit in uh, forums and discuss and let it go. And like you said, after party and over. But nobody does anything concrete. The only concrete action that took place was the responsibility um, to protect in Libya under the UN uh, guidance. But after that, so many terror attacks, so many blatant attacks by uh, countries on each other. Has a collective responsibility come in the international system? It doesn't come in. There is always a blind eye that is turned in. In fact, not even a blind eye, they put on blinkers. And they choose to ignore. <laughs> so what about, what about uh, the proxy problem? You know, you, I mean, Iran is uh, successfully operating proxies. Um, and it's a lesson. It's a lesson for Russia. You know, maybe Russia is teaching or learning that lesson. And it's a lesson for the Chinese, too. You know, they're, they're really all over the West Pacific. And, and they're trying to operate through proxy countries, proxy organizations, and for that matter, proxy terrorists. So it, it's dangerous business, but, it, but on, a, on, a, on a continuing basis, what you have is this kind of war of attrition, a war of uncertainty, a war that really doesn't get kinetic. Nobody wants boots in the ground. Uh, they, they just want to maintain the status quo, but creep up on the power side and ultimately take over without firing a shot. Brilliant. 
without firing a shot. And so th the proxies help them. Now, when I say it, that proxies are dangerous, I'm thinking of World War I, set in motion a world war, because everybody is ready for a world war. And they visualized boots on the ground, they visualized kinetic violence, um, and they had all kinds of agreements for uh, mutual defense and, um, and the like. And, and when that triggered uh, all these agreements, when it triggered all these war plans, that's when you had um, World War I. Uh, see the book uh, Guns of August by uh, Barbara Tuckman out of Columbia. And so um, that could happen. So it's dangerous to have proxies. It's dangerous to have proxy terrorists because they could really start something up. And so if you're going to have proxies, you have to be careful. You have to manage them. You have to give them limits. Uh, you have to watch them and make sure they don't go too far too fast. Otherwise, you know, it'll be out of control for them and you. Do you agree? Yes, Jay. Yes, Jay. Absolutely right on this. Proxy is done to, uh, you know, they develop to be your adversary. Because the moment they don't get the nurturing from the person, they turn against the mentor, uh, if you know what I mean. It is like this, like Pakistan was uh, nurturing terror camps uh, against India. But the moment India has blocked them, there have been more uh, bomb attacks within Pakistan by the terrorists rather than on India. They turn, turn on the mentor. Why? Because firstly, they don't have loyalty. They work only for rewards. So the proxies that Iran harbors in Hezbollah, in all these places against Israel, if Iran stops supplying them, they will attack Iran. Uh, if, um, you know, Al-Qaeda was one of the proxies in Afghanistan, we were training them as people who would protect American interests, but they turned us against and they had the 9-11 uh, attack on, on American soil. So you never know how dangerous your uh, virus, if I say, uh, turns out to be. They develop, they mutate, and they. Uh, this is the uh, problem with the proxies, Jay. They, after mentoring, they develop to have a mind of their own. And that is when they become dangerous. That is when they come into your territory and at, or they become trigger points. If a proxy does something and the uh, finger points at you, the attack will be on you. Yeah, like a, like a Super K, uh, mm -hmm. ISIS K, like, like Prigozhin. Prigozhin was a kind of a proxy operating for uh, uh, Putin in Africa. And then he turned against Putin. It didn't last very long, but that was a real threat to Putin. I also, since you talked about Pakistan, we should talk about the Himalayas. There was an article in the paper recently about continuing fighting between Indians and Chinese in the Himalayas, not with guns, not with rifles, not with mortars, but with sticks. It's back to sticks and stones. Um, why, why that? Is there some fundamental agreement that governs them? Is this yeah. the way you maintain a kind of war of attrition and make a political, geopolitical statement without ever killing anybody? Although some people have been killed up there in the Himalayas. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah uh, this was a blunder of the Prime Minister uh, Jawaharlal Nehru when he did not develop this border or did not define this border. He, in fact, he said, let the border be because it is inaccessible. Just let it be as it is and let it be underdeveloped. So big, big blunder of Jawaharlal Nehru. And that has been punishing India since now. So there, there's no well-defined border. Each side, side claims that this is our line, this is our line. It's, uh, you know, and uh, no, fire, uh, no, they're fighting with sticks because there's a, 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 a treaty that within two kilometers, no firepower is allowed. Two kilometers. So you want to defend, you can defend with clubs and sticks and your fists. So uh, that is why they fight like schoolboys. We had this discussion earlier, remember, first show. Uh, so they uh, they don't have no firepower, two kilometers. And it's high up in the Himalayas, Jay. And uh, in the winter, it is absolutely inaccessible. So this continues and it will continue till China and India reach a line to be drawn. Bound we don't have a boundary line there. It was uh, Einstein, I think, that said World War III would be fought with sticks and stones. And now, <laughs> <laughs> and now we have a war that's being fought by sticks and stones. It may be 
uh, you know, harbinger of the future. What comes out of this conversation, Rupmati, and that's it's really important, is mutation. Yes. The notion of war, the notion of weapons, the notion of boundaries and sovereignty and aggression, uh, the notion of uh, hybrid and uh, asymmetric war, it's mutating. They're, all of these things are mutating. They're changing because it's public. It's in the newspaper. And even if it wasn't in the newspaper, um, these countries and their intelligence agencies could find out what everybody else is doing, um, and they could collaborate with their friends or erstwhile friends. And gee, it creates a kind of chaos. I think we have chaos now because we have so much uncertainty about who is where and what they are doing and what their goals are and what weapons they have and will develop and how they will use propaganda on their neighbors and friends and everywhere. Um, the, the borders are mutating too. The borders are down. Um, you know, after what? After in the 60s and 70s, after World War II, the borders of Europe came down. Now they're up, but are they really up? Um, because the migrants have changed all of that. And so, oh yeah, and one other thing, climate change has yeah. a huge effect on this. Your climate change has forced people to leave their ancestral homeland and move, say, from the global south to the global north to everything they ever aspire to do in countries they aspire to go to, and they somehow get there. And this disrupts those countries. Um, and this leads to, you know, democratic changes, uh, a move to the right. It leads to divisiveness. It leads ultimately to violence. Your thoughts about the effect of climate change on war? Jay, you, you bring out such a valid point uh, that climate change is going to do so, so many things. You count how many countries have rivers and mountains as their boundary. When the rivers change the course, will the boundaries change also? So that is a big thing. Rising sea levels, they will gulp up uh, the cities, the coastal cities. Uh, New Zealand is uh, sea, seaside beaches, uh, your houses, they're up for sale because they know it's going to a few years left for them to be gulped up. So uh, climate change is also nature's warfare on humans, isn't it, Jay? So uh, that is that is also going to play a big, big factor coming up. Yeah, well, don't forget the agriculture and while those people in um, sub-Saharan Africa or Saharan mm -hmm. Africa in the Sahel, uh, they, they, they don't have food and they're motivated by hunger to move north to try to get into the Mediterranean, into Europe, to, just to eat. And so what, what we have is, um, you know, what, what exactly drives the possibility of this chaos? Well, it's everything. It's like if you made a list of the metrics, uh, you know, <laughs> that are threatening, the metrics that drive the possibility of this chaos and thus a, a kind of low level or a war of attrition, um, you get so many things. And one of them is just food and water and the opportunity to lead a decent life. Uh, so we're at war about all of those things and the borders, the boundaries don't make too much difference because um, these things are a matter of survival. You know? So my question for you now is, Rupmati, what do we do? <laughs> Jay, you, we just live in peace, isn't it? Uh, but Jay, uh, it's been very, very surprising these past few years that uh, they have normalized war and they have bought it into from the headlines to just being part of your daily routine. And uh, words like genocide, words like... Uh, you know, mass destruction, all have become such normal words. It, first, it would create such a uh, panic attack or panic alert that you would want to say, take up, sit up and take notice. Now it's become normal. Russia is annexing Ukraine, normal. Uh, Israel under terror attack, normal. This is not right. The new normal is not right. <laughs> and they're trying to normalize this uh, paranormal situation is what is... Um, very terrifying, Jay. We, we don't live in a world of humanity anymore. And that is where community has gone, humanity has gone, family values. You have uh, um, 
concepts which are destroying uh, i we would i will we will we'll talk about that concepts which are destroying family life the traditional family life lgbtq uh, you know these things are uh, being uh, normalized into the new generation and the new generation when they they grow up with these words like when they hear war uh, they hear pride they, they think this is normal just imagine the future <laughs> not the future of warfare but the future is bleak if you don't change there is a reason why you say stick to traditional or stick uh, you know respect your traditions uh, being traditional is not being old fashioned being tradition is not uh, being outdated it is being uh, grounded to your roots is following a set path of life and uh, j that set path of life has been uh, tested and successful for human civilization time so you coming and trying to change it with these modernized versions of lifestyles and uh, you know normalizing uh, war is going to have create havoc for tomorrow's generation j yeah well you're right i mean one of the weapons here is is um, genocide it's um, torture it's rape it's uh, kidnapping children and trying to remake them um it's a violation of uh, human dignity and human rights it's a um, it's um, it's all of those things it's war crimes that's those, and you're right it's becoming normalized because it happens we read about it we read about it again and there is no accountability none and so i, I don't know how you fix that but let me say this that in an ideal set of circumstances you would have the opportunity to vote for a candidate assuming there was still voting you know in some countries forget about voting you know? uh, yeah. but in a country which still had voting you would vote for decency you would yes. vote for morality you would yes. vote for a representative government however you know fully democratic or not it may be but representative government uh you would vote for the rule of law so you could predict and have certainty about your life and your fortunes and so um i you know i don't know how you would state that as a set of platforms but when you smell a candidate who is not not advancing those decency those principles don't vote for him don't vote for trump uh don't yes. vote for people who are wrecking our world because it's not just that election it's it's everything what are your thoughts about that they yes, you are so right they are you know they are uh, mindset uh, manipulators and uh, this showmanship that trump indulges in is the uh, it manipulates the mindset it manipulates people to think that he is uh, bringing in good change that is not right it will be a downfall you know what i am trying to tell you that this will not be right because he will normalize war more he is putin's Allah, he's Putin's friend. He is uh, Putin feels more at ease with him in the chair than with any other person on the chair. And if um, um, this kind of non-fear the hegemon doesn't exercise, there will be a chaotic political order, Jay. And that chaotic political order will just further uh, deteriorate America's interests, global interests, Jay. And that's why a candidate always has to have you you know it starts from your personal choice your personal single candidate who you choose and then it goes up to the president this is uh, uh, you need a very i don't know what to say awakening or uh, introspective uh, outlook to this election jay because wrong choices are going to really create havoc in the future jay. the principles of It's war the techniques the weapons of war are connected with political weapons uh, it's all yeah. hybrid it's all asymmetric thank you very much rupmani rupmani kandakar a uh, global geopolitical strategist and my guru on so many things <laughs> thank you rupmani aloha aloha ji <laughs> thank you for having me